Um, so Travis is starting off uh, this morning, and he's going to be talking about, well, writing a novel and writing a book. Uh, he, um, uh, well, probably most of you know who he is. Uh, he wrote, he won the, well, his, basically his first and second novels, uh, respectively, won the uh, Prometheus Award, which is a libertarian science fiction award two years in a row, right? Right. Okay, so which is kind of amazing because most first novels are <laughs> not great, um, and he it was basically his first two won you know swept, swept those awards. So um, that's he he's a solid believer in uh, um, craft and and doing things right, <laughs> as you know. Um, those of you who know Travis Corcoran, um, and he's also the author of the um, Escape the City. Um, gigantic volumes that are about um, homesteading escaping the city homesteading yeah, it's yeah it's it's they're they're they're, they're two two uh, volumes and it's amazing i i was i got the kickstarter ones and i'm uh, i'm gonna dig into them pretty soon um so uh travis corcoran he's i don't know you know most of he's morlock on morlock p on twitter probably most of you know who he is he's sort of to the extent we have a keynote speaker i guess that's He's the guy that I had to twist his arm hardest to get here. We'll put it that way. So, without further ado, I'll just... <laughs> yeah, a little bit. So, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for showing up. Um, you know, I think I uh, first started thinking I'd like to be an author someday when I was around nine. And uh, shortly after having that idea, I had two dreams. Uh, the first dream is that someday I'd either be at a con and give a speech or have a book signing, something like that. And the second dream was no one would show up for it. So thank you for helping one of my dreams come true. I appreciate it. Um, no, 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 I, I like it this way, you know, 50%. Um, so, you know, uh, the title of the speech was Picked by Rob, and it is No Shortcuts, Writing a Novel You Can Be Proud Of. Um, and that uh, immediately uh, suggests the question, you know, who am I to uh, arrogate to myself that lecture? And the answer is, I didn't. Rob did. Uh, so I will try to live up to Rob's expectations. Um, so, th you know, the, the topic is not just about writing, but sort of uh, writing to a certain goal. Um, and this, you know, asks the question, why write? Uh, you know, back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, during the heyday of the science fiction genre, one answer might be to, you know, make a career out of it, to make big money. Um, the situation has shifted. Uh, a lot of entertainment dollars go to video games and other things these days. So, uh, you know, there are a couple of reasons for writing. One is to write something that you're proud of, and one is to write money. And I would say, you know, pick one of those, and it should be to be proud of, because you're not going to get rich doing this. Um, but writing something that you uh, can be proud of is actually a really uh, great goal. Um, you know, I make a lot less doing writing than I do software engineering and other stuff, um, but it's one of the things that I'm sort of uh, most proud of doing and have checked off a big uh, life goal on the checkbox. So, um, Writing well versus writing not, this is a choice that you can make. Um, and, you know, I would suggest that anyone who's capable of writing a first draft of something, just having the concentration and the focus and the ability to, you know, read and write, can either write well or write less than well. And if you, you know, th there are some people out there uh, who have self-help books or writing books, uh, you know, write like a beast and here's how to write eight or 12 novels a year. Uh, I do not endorse that approach. I think that you cannot... Uh, write well and quickly. Uh, now, during the pulp era, uh, you know, in the magazines in the 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, you know, there, there are some gifted individuals. Robert Heinlein could write a story in a day or two, publish it, and he's still Robert freaking Heinlein. Um, Harlan Ellison famously wrote very fast and well, uh, and he also used amphetamines. Um, so, so I can't speak to that side. Uh, you know, maybe we can get Lowell later talking about ADHD meds as an auxiliary to this panel. Um, but, uh, I will talk about uh, straight edge writing well. Um, now, whenever you set a high goal of, you know, I should be able to you know, run a mile in this period or I should be able to play guitar um, and, and, you know, and play it well, that immediately says, so wait, you're saying I have to be perfect. I can't, you know, do an intermediate thing. 
and, and that's terrible. It creates this very steep cliff where you, know, you can either know nothing or you can be perfect at it. And I'm not saying you should never write poorly. Writing poorly, your first draft is gonna be terrible. My first drafts were terrible. Um, you, know, you should do that, you should circulate it to friends, you should think about it, and you should keep honing your craft. Don't be afraid to start. You, know, you can't write well without writing, uh, so absolutely you know, get into the game, start doing stuff, and write your first draft. Um, there's a long tradition in writing of something that's called drawer novels. You write a novel you, from start to finish, and it's so good that it goes in a drawer and the drawer gets closed and never comes out again. And there are a bunch of reasons to do this. One thing that people say in writing is that you won't get good at writing until you've written a million words. And uh, I found that very interesting. Um, you know, artists uh, have often said, you know, you need to do a thousand or ten thousand sketches before you get it. Uh, this ties into the meme of about five or ten years back, about ten thousand hours. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, you need to get started, and that's the first reason to start writing at all, just to get the practice hours in. But the second is, a lot of good ideas might come out in there, um, and while the novel that you create uh, during your first practice year or two or three might not be publishable on its own, there are going to be scenes in there, there's going to be characters in there, there's going to be, you know, word choices in there that do have some magic and get recycled into your final uh, project. Uh, so that's the good news. You can do it, and it's just a matter of putting in the hours. The bad news is that writing fiction is, in my opinion, you know, I, I'm not gifted at it the way some are who just naturally uh, jumped into it. It is super hard. Um, I've been writing for a long time. I published my first article in a national magazine when I was 13, um, and I've written a bunch of, you know, how-to and other non-fiction things since then. So when I sat down at the age of, I don't know, 39 or 41 or something and said, time to write a novel, I'm really going to do it, I thought, you know, all right, I know what I'm doing with this writing thing. Uh, I'm going to buckle down. I'm going to turn out a draft. And uh, I did. Over the course of a year, I uh, wrote an, uh, the first novel. And I was mixed on it. You know, there was some, there was a lot to learn, and it was a lot harder than I thought it uh, thought it was going to be. And then when I finished, I realized it was absolute garbage. Uh, and this was uh, Powers of the Earth and Causes of Separation, the two novels that later went on to win Best Novel of the Year. Of the year. Um, and the difference between the first draft and you know eventually winning those awards was doing on the order of six more drafts. And so I did a draft a year for about six years. And at the end of it, I sort of went back and I looked up the word count of each of these novels and I added it together and it was about a million words. So uh, that rule of thumb worked for me. So uh, we're gonna talk about uh, what does it mean to you know, write something that's excellent? What is excellence? Uh, the Greek, and I never studied ancient Greek, so uh, excuse my pronunciation, had a word, arite, uh, which means excellence. And if you've studied any philosophy, there's the concept of uh, virtue ethics, and this is what the Greeks and later the Romans thought of, you know, sort of uh, the height of achievement, just to be excellent at something, whether it's oratory or uh, stone carving or leadership in battle, etc. Um, and they had two other words. One is episteme, uh, which means knowledge in sort of an intellectual way. You, you know, you go to high school or college for uh, episteme. And the other was techne, which means craft. And craft is not uh, an intellectual form of knowledge. It's more hands-on knowledge. A carpenter, you know, um, maybe after 20 or 30 years on the job, just knows exactly how to hold a chisel in order to mortise a socket. He knows exactly how hard to, you know, hold the carving knife as he's doing something. And so my assertion is that in the craft of writing, there is both episteme and techne, and when you put them together, you get uh, arite, which is excellence. So uh, I will dig into the details of what I think uh, uh, builds these uh, skills. Um, or actually, there, there's two parts. First, I'll talk about how to get from here to there, and then the second thing is I'll talk about digging into the details. So how to get from here to there, uh, you have to read, and uh, obviously, uh, and I say obviously, but these days there's a lot of fanfic and you know self uh, stuff self-published on Kindle that is really garbage. But it's garbage in an interesting way. It isn't like a garbage Heinlein pastiche. It's not a garbage uh, Isaac Asimov pastiche. It's a garbage World of Warcraft ripoff. Um, and these are people who are not reading novels. Um, they are playing video games or they're watching you know uh, science fiction movies. <clears throat> and the different arts are different, and they have different things that make them good or bad. So when you are having a video game, the uh, shape of the sword and the manner in which it swings through the air and the sound that it makes, these are important. I, I presume I don't play video games much, uh, but they lead to the experience and they lead to a compelling uh, situation. Um, but these do not lead to a compelling novel. Um, 
if you're reading a book and there's something about, you know, the curve of the sword was sort of fractal at the base, but then it got smoother, and then at the edge there was sort of electric blue. It's just a whole bunch of words. Um, so you need to read, and you need to read in genre, um, because, you know, Heinlein and Asimov and Niven and Pornell and all these other greats show how science fiction novels work. Um, to, and you need to understand the uh, genre. Now, different genres achieve different things. You can write about uh, two people in a spaceship, and you can write about it in a science fiction way, which is going to focus the emphasis on how the spaceship works and where they're going and why they're there. You could write in a different genre. You could write a mystery in space, and, and it's been done. And this would focus on individual motivations and sort of partial knowledge and suspicions and everything, and you wouldn't have to dig into how the life support system works. You could write a romance in space, which, you know, ignores all of that and is much more, um, you know, into the individual characters. So, and... and Every genre is great. You can write any, any genre you want, but they have different expectations about what's on the page and what's left off. So by reading in genre, you will learn what you need to write in your genre novel. Um, and then you should also read out of genre. Um, a lot of people get compartmentalized. They like, uh, you know, Terry Pratchett, so they read every single Terry Pratchett novel. Uh, but Terry Pratchett was coming up with ideas not only from his own head, but from wider society and from other pieces of art. Uh, and the same with, you know, Heinlein and uh, the other greats. And so reading out of genre helps you avoid staleness, it helps you learn from the greats, um, and it helps you understand what writing well means. So uh, we've talked about, you know, getting data, we've talked about writing yourself, um, and then, uh, you know, if you put these all together, you do, and then you measure, um, and then you, you, what you're measuring is the deviation from uh, excellence or rete or from your goal. And, uh, you know, I did that in my first draft. I did a thing, and then I compared it to, how does this compare to Heinlein or Neil Stevenson? And my God, there's a huge gap. The characterization was much worse. The plot was much worse. Everything was much worse. And so the important thing is to measure that focus on that and, you know, pay attention. Um, and then you can try another draft and attempt to uh, decrease the delta that you're off of the target. Uh, and I sum that up as do, measure, analyze, and repeat. And measuring implies that you know the delta between uh, you, what you're doing in excellence, and this implies that you understand excellence. Uh, and two final thoughts on this. Be a harsher critic than any of your readers. If you do that, then, you know, uh, you'll not be embarrassed. You'll, you'll be embarrassed in the privacy of your own home. When you can fix it, you won't be embarrassed after it's out there and people are leaving you one- and two-star reviews. And Sun Tzu... <coughs> Sun Tzu had a quote, the more sweat on the training field, the less blood on the battlefield. So, you know, uh, be embarrassed by your bad work at home, um, and no one else has to know that it's there. So I talked before about different genres, and uh, I've got this thought that inspiration flows downhill. And by that, I mean that um, there's reality, and reality has tons of plots in it. We've got, you know, Caesar, we've got, you know... Uh, uh, the Battle of Agincourt, we've got all these great things, and there's a selection and a winnowing effect that, you know, tons of stuff ha happens every day. You have breakfast and you spill your coffee. That never makes it into literature, but there are some great things that happen, you know, the Battle of Cannae or D-Day, and these things uh, are selected and winnowed and preserved in history and then eventually uh, further downhill. And so we move from reality, and the best of that filters into mythology and great books, for example, the Bible, and then mythology um, and the Bible and other things filter into classic literature as far as the themes and, you know, heroic tropes and other things. And by classic literature, I'm talking, again, you know, tons of literature is written, and classic literature is that that's selected and lasts the ages. So if we look at, you know, Shakespearean plays um, or Dante. And then classic literature, uh, ideas and tropes and, and skills filter downhill from there into classic genre novels. So we're looking at, you know, Foundation and Dune, and, you know, you can list, you know, five or six other books. And then the classic genre novels filter downhill uh, into just generic genre novels and then down into movies and finally into TV, video games, and comics. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, video games and comics, uh, etc., are lower art forms. Uh, there can be a huge amount of artistry in these. But what I am saying is that sort of as far as the tropes and ideas uh, and skills as far as plot, you start up at the high ends um, and these tend to percolate downhill. Or, and I don't want to say downhill because it sounds judgmental. But for whatever reason, there's this chain where things filter in a certain direction. And this is, again, important because it touches on something I said earlier. If you're not reading not just science fiction in the genre, but if you're not reading Shakespeare um, and Dante and, um, oh gosh, I forget, uh, 
mainstream authors are forgetting uh, are escaping me right now. But if, if you're just in a limited pool, or worse yet, uh, in a smaller sub pool of video games, you're not going to learn the things that you need to do. So read Shakespeare, read Iliad, read the Odyssey, read Russian literature, read Herman Melville, read something. Uh, and I have two examples of this in science fiction or in uh, popular fiction. Gibbon's Decline and Fall led into Asimov's Foundation series, and uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet led into the TV show Sons of Anarchy. And to the degree that literature resonates with these great themes, uh, you'll do a better job and your book will have uh, some staying power. So within a genre, uh, genre is in conversation with itself. Uh, and what does that mean? Um, it means to some degree that when we interact with novels that have already been out there, A, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, um, but B, we're taking uh, thoughts that other authors have had and we're criticizing them or interacting with them and then saying something back to the community. Uh, a famous example of this is Heinlein wrote Starship Troopers and then Joe Haldeman uh, wrote The Forever War. And there's a story where Joe Haldeman was a relatively new author and he'd just written this book which was having the same themes but sort of criticizing Heinlein with his gung-ho attitude in Starship Troopers um, and instead saying, you know, maybe troops are demoralized, maybe war isn't glorious, maybe everything is a Charlie Foxtrot, sometimes these things are a bad idea. And Haldeman was at some science fiction convention and he saw Heinlein down a corridor and Heinlein saw him and started making a beeline for him. And Haldeman uh, says, oh God, is he gonna, you know, scream at me? Is he gonna deck me? Because I've sort of criticized what he's done. And Heinlein reached him and, you know, stuck out his hand and said, that was amazing, great. And so uh, there's the phrase, criticism, you know, is a form of flattery, and it is. Uh, there's the uh, red pill blogger from 10 or 15 years ago, Roisy. And uh, Roisy said, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. So Haldeman, um, did not have the opposite of love for Heinlein. He was paying attention to Heinlein and he was interacting with Heinlein's ideas. Uh, and in my own novels, um, you know, I was uh, interacting with Heinlein's um, Starship Troopers. Excuse me, uh, with Heinlein's uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And on the back of uh, my novel, I've got a quote from Eric S. Raymond saying that, you know, this is something I've been looking for and waiting for for decades. Someone who responds to Heinlein and endorses him, but also criticizes him and takes a fresh take. So I would say there is always fertile soil there. Uh, you know, take one of your favorite novels that doesn't go into some corners, that you 80% love but 20% disagree with, uh, and put your own take on it. Um, take it seriously, and, uh, you know, authors are, are not you know, kings or gods, you know, they're just people, and their ideas, uh, likewise, are not, you know, uh, beyond criticism. Uh, so if you interact with the genre, uh, there's always fertile ground. Um, okay, examples. Uh, so one Starship Trooper is leading into the Forever War, and Lord of the Rings uh, has inspired um, Michael Moorcock's Elric of Milnabone and also Perdido Street Station by China Mayville. Um, and uh, some inspirations and conversation with genre from my own novels. Obviously, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Heinlein. There's a classic short story, The Cold Equations. Uh, I have a phrase, Priceless Eggs in Variable Gravity, which is taken from uh, The Moat in God's Eye. Um, there's a reference to the right-wing novel, Unintended Consequences. Obviously, The Dogs, uh, a reference to the Tynes in Werner Vinge's novels, but also um, David Brin's Uplift novels. Um, there's a lot of other stuff here. Cities in Flight by James Blish, uh, The Getaway Special by Jerry Oltian, Gilp in Space. Uh, so this is, you know, we talked before about reading widely out of genre and reading the classics, but you should also read widely uh, in genre so that you can interact with the community. So um, now this is a high level approach. Let's get into low level details, the actual skills that you need to write a novel. I've got about 10 or so bullet points. If you listen to an eight-year-old kid relate the plot of his movie, it says, and then, and then, and then. So, you know, the Terminator. So there's this flash of electricity, and then there's this guy, and he's made out of metal, and then he kills a woman, and then he goes on a car chase, and then he does this, and it's just a list of unrelated events. But the actual plot of the Terminator is a bunch of things linked together with because. Uh, the... Uh, Two people, you know, come back in time because one of them is trying to extinguish humanity and one of them is trying to, you know, kill off the human race. Um, they were safe. Um, and then because of this, uh, the second one is there. And then because of this, they need to find Sarah Connor. And because of this, the second one needs to get there first. And because of this, they need weapons and on and on. 
Uh, another point about writing is you need to have tension and risk. Uh, everyone criticizes Mary Sue writing, and Mary Sue refons, uh, refers to two things. One is an author self-insert where the author can do nothing wrong, um, but also there's no tension and risk. If you have the most powerful you know, man or woman in the world, and everyone loves them, and this, then there's no doubt that they're gonna foil the alien invasion. You know, it's all gonna work out okay, this person is ultra powerful. So putting your character in a position of tension and risk uh, is absolutely key to keeping audience involvement. No one wants to look at the best person in the world waltz through a situation. And so we look at Moby Dick, for example. They're on a sailing ship, supplies are low, uh, parts of the ship are breaking. Uh, there's this tension and risk of the only smart move is to turn back, and yet the captain won't turn back. So lives are on the line. So when you write a novel, you need to have uh, risk. How are novels structured? There is a uh, classic three-act structure, and this goes back to, I believe, Plato, uh, and three-act structures have stood the list, um, test of time um, because they work as far as dramatic presentations, and I'll get into more details later. Um, another point is cultural touchstones and tropes, uh, which means that you know people have some expectations, there's plot points that they like, and you should always vary these a bit, but if you hit them, people will be involved. Um, Thematic unity, I'll dig into these later. Stylistic unity, world building, build up and payoff, characterization, character ensembles, pacing, dialogue. You need to do point of view correctly and need to have information density in a novel without looking like it's dense. So let's see, I already covered therefore um, uh, rather than and then. And one big reason for this is when you have therefore, you have rationality and causality. And this is very important to uh, sort of our tribe here of right wing. I saw someone, um, maybe it was actually on the mugs and t-shirts or maybe it was uh, someone who was wearing a t-shirt. Reality is that which continues to exist when you, know, you uh, disbelieve in it. And you know, we are all grounded in reality. We think that it doesn't matter what the in-tribe says about this fact or that fact. What matters is reality in the ground. And so that should reflect in fiction. Uh, people are probably familiar with the New Wave uh, School of Science Fiction in the 70s under Harlan Ellison and Michael Moorcock. And it was very experimental and very experiential. Um, and uh, I, I think that New Wave, while an interesting artistic genre, uh, is the opposite of what we're getting at. We need to you know, write things uh, like the world is. Um, <clears throat> A random Dungeons and Dragons dungeon crawl is and then. You open a door, oh, and something happens. You open a different door, you know, something happens. And this is the opposite of, for example, Lord of the Rings, where everything is tied together and happens for reasons. Uh, I talked about tension and risk. Without tension, there's no audience involvement, and without risk, there's no meaning to anything. So you need to pick stakes, and stakes need to be big uh, in order to get people interested. Uh, but there's a mistake that's often made, which is we're saving the entire universe, or we're saving the entire planet. And uh, Marvel movies go off in this direction. And I think that there is a lot of good fiction to be had in, you know, saving one family on a spaceship, or saving one town, or, you know, saving a company. So uh, pay attention to tension and risk. I talked earlier about three-act uh, structure, which comes from Aristotle's Poetics in 335 BC. Uh, why? One answer is it's a cultural norm, and if you're writing for people in Western society, this is every story they've ever read is in something like a three-act structure, so they want to read stories that you know make sense. Um, but also, it's pragmatic. The three-act structure uh, satisfies questions. Who, what, there's a challenge, a reaction, and a resolution. So digging in a little bit, the first act is the introduction, and it's 25% more or less, and it introduces the characters, the world, the situation, and the risks. And then the second act is the middle 50%. And this is where there are challenges. And each challenge is a little bigger, there's a little more danger, and it gets somewhat resolved, but it doesn't resolve all the way to baseline. And then another challenge comes along, and it gets somewhat resolved. And risks keep getting bigger. So if we use Star Wars, oh, and uh, the third act is resolution. You know, what happens afterwards? And I'll use Star Wars as an example of this. The first act, uh, obviously, is the chase over Tatooine. The droids uh, get out in an escape pod. They land near Luke's home. Luke meets Ben Kenobi. Um, and a lot of things happen. And each of them is, you know, and therefore. But we're learning a lot as we go. We're learning about, you know, the good side and the bad side, you know, in this imperial struggle. I'll let the breeze stop and I'll take a sip. Um, and then the second act um, starts uh, in, what is it, Moss Eisley, where we've got uh, 
the stormtroopers and they uh, almost catch our people and then we go into a bar and there's a fight and then a second fight and then we get out and the Millennium Falcon escapes just in the nick of time and then they're going to Alderaan and each time, you know, there's a problem and they get out of it, but they're a little bit worse than where they started. They go to Alderaan, they're sucked into the Death Star, they escape from the Death Star, but you know, now they don't know where to go. And the final peak of the second act is obviously the raid on the Death Star, and these are insurmountable odds. We've got a bunch of heroes in very small fighters going up against a battle station the size of a moon. Um, and so the structure, the sawtooth ever ascending more tension, uh, is the way to structure the second act. And Star Wars actually has a laughably short third act. Uh, the Death Star blows up, and then we're at the uh, award ceremony, and Chewie yells, and it's like 45 seconds long, and then credits. Uh, but it works. Um, Lord of the Rings has a longer third act, which is the scouring of the Shire. Um, and there are alternatives to three-act structure. Um, there is the four-act structure, where you take the middle act, which is the middle 50%, you cut it in half. There's a six-act structure. These are really sort of organizational tools. Um, they don't change the overall dramatic flow. In every structure, yeah. What is the purpose of the third act? Right, uh, that's a great question. It is to provide resolution. Um, at some level, you know, it, and it, it's also to explain what had happened. If we imagine Star Wars and the Death Star blows up and the credits roll, you're left, okay, I, I think that was it, right? Did we defeat the bad guys entirely? Or was that even an explosion? Or was that a shield field going up? Um, and, you know, Star Wars, the cinematography, pretty well explains that. It's a pretty big explosion. Um, I think Han yells over the radio, okay, let's get out of here. You know, we've done the job. Um, but it's to provide resolution. And I think that uh, both culturally and also sort of biologically innate in human existence, we want that peak experience and a ceremony to explain that, yes, this really happened, sort of a shelling point where we all see that each other sees that we've gotten there. And so you see these uh, all throughout our culture. The purpose, what is the purpose of college graduation? I mean, theoretically, you walk out of your last class senior year and you're done. Um, but people have this sort of need and desire to have it fully summed up and stamped with an imprimatur that, you know, it's official. Uh, now, I, I personally blew off my college graduation and didn't go, and the same with my high school graduation. Um, but in general, I hear that people like ceremonies and like to do things. Um, so the commonalities between the three, four, five, six act structure is that we have an introduction where we explain the world and the conflict and the characters, and then we have a series of rising tensions, and finally we have a resolution and a cleanup. And you know, the, the word cleanup is important too. There's a little bit of OCD tidiness that we wanna see, you know, okay, the ring falls into the lava. Do they get home? You know, uh, what happens to, you know, Gandalf? Are the dwarves happy? Um, and, uh, you know, on a foot race, you know, people go through the finish line and then they will walk for another 10 or 15 minutes just to let their bodies cool down. They, they don't immediately sit down and chug a beer. Uh, it would be a shock to the system. So this is a peaceful off-ramp from the adventure, among other things. Um, another bullet point, having wrapped up uh, the three-act structure, plot and character interwoven. There are effectively two ways to sit down and plot out a novel, and in the you know, writing community, uh, the people who just sit down and go by the seat of their pants, like, oh, and I guess you know, Terry is the kind of person who'd do this, so then he opens the door and hmm, there's a dragon. It's all very exciting. And then there are the kind of people who are methodical and use spreadsheets and plot everything out, and unsurprisingly, I'm in the latter group. Um, but both of these approaches emphasize a thing, and uh, one is characters and, you know, sort of what are the natural behaviors of these characters, and the other is what is the arc of things that happen in a story. Both of these are equally important. Just because some people like to start with one and other people like to start with the other doesn't mean that one is necessary and the other is unnecessary. They're both crucially necessary to a plot or to a book. And the, uh, to, to write an excellent novel, you need to have both of these things interleaved uh, over the course of the novel. And in each chapter and in each scene, you need to be doing some work to advance character development and character conflict, but also some work to uh, advance the overall plot. And if we, again, go back to Lord of the Rings, uh, with the hobbits, uh, you know, journeying towards Mordor, there's a lot of, you know, just wonderful, beautiful scenes of friendship and cooking potatoes um, over fires uh, as they're advancing forward to bring the ring to its destruction. Um, and let's see. So uh, 
and you can use these as you're writing as tools. One will drive the other. So, you know, you if you're a plot person first, you'll say a plot needs to happen here. I need to uh, tell my readers that there's a big conflict going on. Well, how do I tell that? And this was my failure and why I couldn't write anything, even though I tried in my 20s and 30s. I kept writing timelines of how the world develops. Like, you know, and then there's this war and then there's a hundred people on the moon and then there's a thousand people on the moon. But you can't just say, you know, people are on the moon. Like, who landed there? Why did they land there? What were their motivations for leaving whatever they were doing before? And once I cracked that nut, I found it possible to write. So in my novels, um, I needed a revolution on the moon. And, you know, as a sort of software engineer Spurg type, I knew that. And then I had to back up into the human aspect of it of I need a person. So I created Mike Martin to do that. But then I needed to show how Mike Martin deals with adversity before the huge plot point. I needed to do this in Act One. Uh, so I created a character of Leroy Fournier to you know, have Mike interact with something and show who Mike is. And then to show other aspects of Mike Martin, I created the character of Javier uh, to show how Mike deals with friendship. So as you're doing your own uh, novels, you'll have uh, a plot point the plot point will suggest individuals, and then as you have each of these individuals, you might create other plot points or other individuals to expose aspects of these people. So it's sort of a web of going from plot point to person, person to plot point. We talked earlier about uh, cultural touchstones and tropes. Now, everyone is uh, familiar with TV tropes, I imagine. What exactly is a trope? Uh, a trope is a name for a pattern. Um, we probably have 50% of the people here are software engineers, I, I would guess. Um, and so in the field of software engineering, there's the concept of patterns. Uh, so you might have a client server pattern or a decorator pattern, these sorts of things. And uh, these behaviors or typical things that software engineers did over and over and over existed for decades before there was the Gang of Four book that named them. But naming things is useful because once you have a name, uh, it sort of condenses your knowledge and puts boundaries around it and allows very high-speed communication. So, you know, I can say to Hans, you know, oh, in your novel I noticed the XYZ trope. I don't have to say, you know that thing that you see in a lot of novels where often there's a friendship but then there's a tension in a friendship? You know, I can just say, the, the, you know, whatever it is, the, the three-sided friendship. And Hans is like, yes, I very intentionally did that. And, um, so it allows for high-speed communication, not just with other authors, but also with your readers. Um, when you're, you know, now that we've got Lord of the Rings in the cultural memory, if you have two characters who act, you know, like uh, Sam and um, Bilbo, you say, ah, the friends on an adventure trope. And it allows you to communicate a point with fewer words, so it allows you to have higher information density. Um, and tropes exist because they work. They reference deep cultural patterns, and they often are cross-cultural patterns. Um, Everyone has probably heard that Star Wars uh, with the two droids references, I think, some Kurosawa film. Uh, thank you. Um, and so, you know, things are cross-cultural, I suggest, when they come from human nature. Um, and so having two side characters who are comic relief is something that, you know, uh, Shakespeare had often, you know, with uh, guards or something uh, that we have in Star Wars, that we have in Kurosawa movies. And so if you look at tropes and do things that are tropish, not slavishly and, you know, not poorly, uh, you're going to be focusing on things that people enjoy and that speak to human nature. Um, and I had one fan of the novels write a TV tropes page for Aristillus, uh, which was huge. I loved that, so thank you very much. Um, and there's, you know, 15 or 20 tropes there. One is heroes love dogs. One is big effing gun. One is ban on AI. Um, and, you know, people will look for and enjoy tropes in your fiction. Uh, but there's use and abuse of tropes. Um, so under use, uh, the information theorist Claude Shannon talked about uh, information density. And if you have a telegraph line, for example, that goes dot, 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 dot forever, there's almost no information here. I suppose you could say it's like a parakeet. You know, when it stops going, something has happened. You've conveyed one bit of information. Um, on the other hand, a, uh, a line that has pure white noise and it's absolute static probably has a huge amount of information in it. And if I had the proper uh, decrypt key or algorithm to get it out, uh, that would be maximally condensed, compressed information. Um, but it's a lot of hard work to look at that, you know, and, and we have sort of video codecs that do this. If you look at a video stream going across the wire, it's pure white noise and it's incomprehensible because any duplication is a wasted opportunity to squeeze more information in. 
When we write novels, we are not writing for video codecs, we are writing for humans who are there for entertainment purposes. So we want to um, use tropes to condense more information, but not to pack things in absolutely maximally, but to condense stuff in so that we can have a little bit of rest and room and air, so that we can see a thing quickly and enjoy it. Moving on from tropes to theme. Um, Theme is a meaning apart from the action. So if you read, you know, literally my novel, uh, Aristillus um, series, you've got an action which is a specific lunar rebellion. And, you know, I don't know if the word freedom occurs in the book at all or if it, you know, happens it's two or three times. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, freedom is an underlying theme. Uh, decentralized action and... Uh, um, voluntarily coordination are obviously other themes in Aristillus, and they're brought up many times. Um, theme is defined as a recurring, unifying subject or idea, a motif that helps us understand a work of art better. Uh, so in Moby Dick, the plot is a guy hunts a whale, but the theme is duty, defiance, death, and obsession. Uh, I, I think that you can write a decent book that has only plot, but I think every excellent uh, piece of fiction, whether it's a movie or a book or something else, is going to have a theme underlying the plot. And um, there's also, uh, when we talk about theme, recursion or self-similarity, as above, so below. So when you have a theme and it's well done, it is tied in in a lot of places that, you know, if the theme of your book is duty, we're probably going to have the hero, you know, in warfare and he wants to leave the trench and run away, but he doesn't. And then simultaneously, there might be a parallel thread where uh, his commanding officer, who seems like a hard ass and who's telling him to do his duty, is in turn doing his duty to a higher ideal. And maybe even the rebel who, you know, looks like a coward and does leave the trench is serving a higher duty. He's doing his duty to a pacifist nature or something. Um, um, and so a theme uh, can have lots of expressions, and I would suggest that the more expressions it has in a plot, the more uh, satisfying and uh, more long-lived the piece of art will be. Um, and so uh, a little bit of uh, teasers or hints for my next two novels that I'm working on now, Aristillus 3 and 4. I've got eight big themes that I'm working on. One is breaking out of systems from the inside. And this is computer hacking and digital physics and left-wing political entryism. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to have any character in the novel say, oh, did you realize that what she's doing by trying to join a political group and then twist its intention is a lot like what the AI is doing in trying to evade its constraints? Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that hopefully readers will pick up on, you know, after they're finished reading the book or three years later. Um, Another theme is, I, I spoke to at least someone here, maybe Will, uh, who said that he's a big fan, like I am, of Slate Star Codex. And the blog, uh, Scott Alexander's blog, State, Slate Star Codex, has one great blog post on left-wing uh, red tribe culture versus blue tribe, and it is survive versus thrive. Uh, the left-wing culture acts as if uh, nature provides an infinite bounty, and all we need to do is sit back and enjoy it. Because if we have any problems, if we have a little bit of crime, if we have a little bit of terrorism, these are deviations from the norm. The universe in general provides wealth and relaxation, and we would be remiss in not enjoying these things to the utmost. The red tribe culture, on the other hand, says that the default state of human nature is, you know, uh, red in tooth and claw. It is, you know, poverty. It is disease. It is war. We're trying to carve out little bubbles of rationality and civilization and technological progress and art and good life. So that's theme number two, uh, the conflict of these two cultures. Theme number three is the propagation of memes. Four, eight calls of trading and threads. Uh, theme five is smaller board games. But there's self-similarity here. because What is a board game other than stylized conflict between two forces? Theme six is economic growth, bubbles and crashes, uh, slavery, power and freedom. And finally, theme eight is random choice within limited environments has greater variance um, in sort of a... Uh, statistical sense. So, uh, again, you know, there's not going to be an Ayn Rand speech in the middle of any of these. And the hero <laughs> says, and now we need to talk about variance in a statistical system. Um, but by me having in mind that I've got, you know, not literally pinned up next to the computer, but in a text file, these themes, and I try to come back and make sure that these are included in how plots develop. And I think that when you have themes, you do a, a greater work of art. And it provides uh, thematic uni unity, which is satisfying. Um, Star Wars, you know, has themes, um, and there is a line of dialogue, don't be too proud of this technological terror that you've constructed. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the 
power of the force. And of course, don't be too proud of this technological terror, which is in fact destroyed by the power of the force. So the theme operates both as a specific plot point with some photon torpedoes or whatever, but also as an overall gestalt of the movie. Uh, the TV show with the top drama, The Shield, uh, has the protagonist, Vic Mackey, violate every single law, and then the act three in the final episode, is Vic Mackey is sent to his own personal hell, where he is forced to obey every single law and sit in a uh, office building. The Alien uh, series uh, has a thematic theme that Sigourney Weaver's character Ripley is not a fighter, she's not a warrior, she's a mother who is a um, unwilling or reluctant uh, combatant, and uh, this is echoed later with her maternal feelings. Uh, I think it's with Newt um, in the second movie, where she says, get away from her, you bitch. Uh, so we have the sort of overall theme of maternal nature in this harsh universe, and then it comes in at multiple times, and that makes it satisfying. Uh, moving on to another plot point, or another point, I'm about um, two-thirds of the way through, if anyone wants to give me a time check or cut me off. Uh, yeah, you're good. Okay. It's, it's uh, just almost dead. We've got another... All right, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, when you're writing a novel, to write a great novel, I would suggest that you want to aim for stylistic unity. Uh, what is style? Style is distinctive features of literary or artistic expression, execution, or performance. That's kind of vague, but we're talking not about plot, not about characters, but about how you construct scenes and how you put sentences on the page. You know, and there's a lot of styles out there. I'm, I'm not a master stylist. It's one of the areas where I'm weaker because I, I don't care as much as I care about other things. Uh, but if I had very long, expressive, poetic sentences for the first hundred pages, and then suddenly shifted to very short sentences, that, that actually might be an interesting stylistic choice if my sentence length was proportional to the amount of action, where, you know, we get into, you know, in the limit, chapow, bam. Um, but if I just randomly shifted for no reason at all, that would be jarring. It would feel like an amateur effort. Um, but it's not just about sentence length or the number of adjectives you use. Um, it's also about the tone. So, you know, is a given scene comedic? Uh, is it uh, a how-to manual? Which, um, what, what is the phrase I'm looking for? Uh, a procedural? Uh, and my zombie uh, short fiction, Caterpillar, is in fact a procedural, where there's lots of details in there about welding, um, you know, uh, to build an armor tank in the apocalypse, for welding armor. Um, and that's a bit of an odd take on it. I, I do it because I like it. I like hanging out in my workshop and welding and building stuff. Um, but the entire uh, series is a procedural, so it's got a consistent tone. And, you know, uh, you know, if you like this sort of thing, you'll like it. And so when you write a book, you know, figure out what you're doing, and then you will speak to your particular readers, and they will like your style, your fans, if you don't shift it on them without reason. Um, and rapid or accidental shifting feels off. World building. Um, you know, obviously Tolkien is the master of this, where he went off and designed seven languages and scripts and all sorts of other stuff, and 5,000 years of backstory. Uh, you don't have to be Tolkien. Um, only Tolkien can be Tolkien. Um, but I would say aim to be 25% of Tolkien. Um, and there's a lot of fiction that just doesn't make sense. If you start, you know, uh, th there's a great YouTube series, Screen Rants, which has pitch meetings. Uh, and if you haven't seen them, look it up. It's great fun. Um, and the format of it is a writer comes into the studio boss and says, okay, I've got this movie XYZ, and the studio boss says, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Why would the character do that? He says, um, so the movie can happen. Um, and this repeats a lot. Now, you can enjoy a 90-minute movie full of explosions without having a deep, unifying universe under it. But when people read a 300- or 700-page novel, it's because they're obsessive, they want to immerse themselves in a world and if you immerse yourself in a world, you end up thinking about the world. That's one of the highest compliments a reader can pay to an author, to, you know, keep thinking about it. And some of the best mail I ever got was from people saying, you know, I read your book, and I can't stop thinking about the Bureau of Sustainable Research, or the dogs, or, you know, do they ever travel to the planet? They've got the AG drive. They can do this. They can do that. And they're taking the various pieces of Legos that you put out there and clicking them together. And if they don't click together in a, you know, satisfying way, that really means that it hasn't put together underneath and before the plot. And they'll start to say, hey, wait a second. They've got the AG drive, but they never used it to do X or Y or Z. Why not? They would have done it. Smart people in this circumstance would have done it. So the way to avoid making sort of amateurish uh, things is 
things to think through your world. If you've got you know a, a future thing where there's a penal colony on Venus, why was the penal colony put on Venus? You can have answers to that. You know, oh, we wanted it there, or there's a religious dictates in this future religion that says the closer to the sun, the more sinful it is. You know, um, and, and then once you have that, think further. Why is the penal colony not on Mercury, for example? Um, and so, one thing I always like to think about is. Uh, I, I refer to it as sort of either calories, you know, um, which is energy flowing through a system. You know, in the real world, we've got calories. You know, photon strikes grass, and grass creates uh, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are eaten by herbivores. Herbivores are eaten by carnivores. And, and if you think through that system, you can say, oh, there's a lot more grass in the world than there are sheep. There's a lot more sheep in the world than there are wolves, um, and, and so forth and so on. And uh, if you do that, you will end up building a biological universe, for example, that has an appropriate realistic structure. Um, in economics, dollars are basically, you know, just a version of calories. They're energy. So you are always going to have a uh, much bigger working class than you will have sort of a lawyer professional class. You can have more professionals than you're going to have elites at the top taxing it. You're going to have pyramids. Uh, and this is relevant if you've got some sort of science fictional worldview where, um, let, let's talk about Firefly and Serenity. We've got uh, the Reavers out on the edge of space. How many Reavers are there? Lit literally, where do they get their food? Where do they get their spaceship parts? You need some sort of ecosystem that explains how this is plausible. I remember playing Dungeons and Dragons when I was 12 or 13, and you know, a as a young OCD spur, uh, I, I was thinking, wait, I've got a dragon down on level seven. What does he eat? Um, and, uh, you know, so, so thinking through Power flows and information flows and economies uh, make sense. And you don't have to do a heck of a lot of it. You can just, you know, uh, do a little bit and it'll make your world uh, much more satisfying. Uh, and then finally, the iceberg uh, principle. Leave six-sevenths of it underwater. And Tolkien probably left 99 one-hundredths of it underwater. But when you explain on the page every single thing you've thought through, um, it loses some of its energy. So keep stuff hidden. And I've had, you know, again, fan mail saying, oh my gosh, the CEO trials that Mike Martin uh, was indicted in, what were those like? And, you know, my answer is, you know, I'm not going to tell you, and, and partially that's because I didn't think through all of those details. But the great thing is you're thinking about it. You're asking me this question. That's what leaving something underwater means. You saw it. You saw it through distorted, you know, water, and you're curious about it. And that's perfect. Um, build up and pay off. The cold beer after a long day of doing, you know, work on the farm or the yard feels great. Woke up this morning and had a cold beer. That would feel disgusting. Um, you are having a reward without uh, the, the requirement to have earned it. Um, and people respect what they've earned. Uh, and this applies in literature and art and film as well. Uh, my wife and I talk about, you know, tropes and, and pan films and, and novels. And one uh, failure mode she's pointed out is she's seen a lot of fan short, you know, five minute films uh, that look, they're composed of nothing but the epic moments of, you know, the person wanders in and they pull the sword out of the stone and, or, you know, they, they deck the other character or they pop open the chest and there's gold there. And the people making these fan films understand art to some degree. They know the part of the movie they love the best and they're right to love it. Those are the best parts. Pulling the sword from the stone is amazing. But what they don't understand is that that beer was earned after a very long day of chopping wood. And they're just presenting the beer 8 a.m. in the morning. And the result is disgusting. It has no emotional tail. Uh, people are probably familiar with Chekhov's gun. Uh, Chekhov, a uh, Russian uh, writer. And uh, his rule is that if there is a gun on the mantle uh, above the fireplace in Act 1, it must be used to kill someone in Act and the inverse of that, of course, is if a gun is used in Act 3, the payoff is so much higher if it was sitting there on the mantle all along. Because you're like, oh my god, that was the gun! It was sitting there, I never thought about it. It was loaded, of course it was loaded. We heard that his father had loaded it, and it all fit together. Uh, and uh, my friend Lowell um, said that, uh, and, and I've got a little bit of spoilers here for my novel, um, but at the end of uh, Aristotle's book two, Causes of Separation, which is, you know, 1,250 or 1,300 pages in the series, a part of the moon, you know, goes flying off, and the title was Causes of Separation. The entire 1,300 pages were an explanation of what those causes were. Uh, 
Similarly, if you read the entire series through and then go back to the first page, I believe it's on page one or page two of the first novel, uh, Mike Martin, the protagonist, and his friend Javier are on the surface of the moon in spacesuits with very large rifles, and one of them accidentally shoots a boulder, and a chunk of the boulder goes spitting off into space. Uh, so these are, you know, Chekhov's guns, and the, the Chekhov gun that I'm absolutely proudest of is in my novels, uh, there are a bunch of uplifted dogs and a human backpacking across the first surface of the moon, and they've got heads-up displays built into the spacesuits, which they have the dogs, uh, who are uh, Tolkien LARPers, have repurposed into uh, augmented reality or virtual reality uh, uh, gameplay. And this ends up being a crucial turning point uh, at the absolute peak of Act 2, again, you know, 1,200 pages later. So uh, people love Chekhov's guns. I've gotten so many emails about that particularly with, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Uh, so I encourage you to have, metaphorically speaking, a murder at the end of Act 2, and metaphorically speaking, put that gun uh, over the mantle on page 1 or 2 or 3. People will love it. Characterization. Um, I'm sure there's you know no more than one or two people here who haven't played a role-playing game in their life, uh, so everyone is at character sheets. <clears throat> character sheets are useful uh, just in a mechanical sense because time and time again over the course of play we'll say, you know, Bar, wait, does your character have a gun? What size is it? You know, what is your strength? I need you to roll against it. And so you're referring to it. It's a cheat sheet, effectively, of important characteristics. If you're writing a novel, um, it is a wonderful tool to have character sheets for your character. And we don't care as much about their strength or their dexterity or their encumbrance. Having a cheat sheet will both allow you to keep your characters consistent, but it will also serve as a forcing function, saying, oh, I wrote down that this guy is an introvert. Let me remember to put that in a scene. Let me have him leave the party early. Let me have him, you know, do whatever. Um, and so this is just a mechanical tool or a piece of advice that if you have character sheets, it will help you write consistent, interesting characters who behave more like actual humans and distinct humans from each other than merely tools that advance the plot forward. Uh, also, ideally, acts are motivated. Um, we were talking earlier about screen rants and like, well, why does the character go out into the haunted house, you know, at 2 a.m.? So the plot can happen. You know, that, that is stupid and it feels stupid. But if, on the other hand, the character is actually scared, but they want to prove themselves in front of their older brother, so they're always looking for opportunities to take on risk, risk that they hate so that they can prove to their brother that they're worthy of blah, blah, blah. Suddenly the uh, piece of art will feel more real, like they're real characters inhabiting it. Characters ideally have arcs, and an arc is growth over time. Um, you know, all of us looking back at our own lives can think about some pivotal moments of, you know, I'm most proud of X because, you know, I always feared X, and then finally I stood up and I did it. And if you can work that into your novels, that is very satisfying. Um, and then finally, under characterization, there's the concept of a hero with a thousand faces, uh, which is a book talking about how there's a hero archetype. And this was perhaps one of the earlier things in the concept of tropes. Uh, so I recommend uh, digging into that book. And I personally think that reluctant heroes are best. Uh, it's the opposite of Mary Sue. And I talked before about Ripley from Aliens. Another reluctant hero is Mad Max from the Mad Max series. And if we remember in Road Warrior, he just wants gasoline. He doesn't want to get engaged in any trouble. He's had a life surviving the apocalypse alone without loyalties. This has been the secret. And Max's growth arc is that he actually cares about someone else for the first time and does something for someone else. And that makes him more interesting than either a character who has always been looking for home. Uh, characters interact uh, just as humans in the real world do in ensembles. Um, and uh, I imagine a lot of people have seen the TV show Silicon Valley. Uh, there is one scene where one of the billionaires is looking down at the crowd. He says, I note that they always sort themselves into groups. There's the chubby one, there's the skinny East Indian, there's the long-haired nerd, etc. Um, and in fiction, we often uh, see characters sort themselves into groups, just as we do in friendships or marriages, etc., uh, where strengths complement weaknesses, and the uh, whole is more than some of the parts. Now, there's a wrong way to build character groups, and this is the video game way, with the tank, the healer, the warrior, the spellcaster. Um, and you, you know, absolutely don't want to do that. The point is not to optimize for battle. The point is to optimize for a friend group or for uh, human traits. Um, 
And uh, so an example of this is Lord of the Rings. Uh, we have Gandalf. Uh, not there to cast spells, but to explain the threat and to explain the world. We have Aragorn to lead and to serve as a rallying point. And we have a Hobbit uh, as the viewpoint character, and that's to serve as the reader's point of view, the any man, smaller than all of the action that goes on uh, around them, but given the opportunity to rise to heroic heights. The final point under characters is villains. Um, I suggest that mustache twirling villains are unrealistic. Uh, we've all had conflicts with people in our real life, and most of these people are not actually psychopaths. They have their own motivations. They weight things differently. You know, in a zoning conflict, for example, um, <laughs> one person might uh, weight rule of law and property values more highly, um, and another person might uh, rate um, friendship networks and how we've always done things more highly. And if you write a story that just has someone who's like, oh, I see these people having fun and being good. I think I will crap all over them. That's not never how life works, but that's rarely how life works. And you will have a much more nuanced, interesting piece of art if you make your villains, uh, you know, sympathetic. And I would suggest that, you know, even in the real world, it pays uh, dividends to look at villains and think, in their own minds, they were trying to do something good. I mean, you know, and uh, this is, this is going to be great because the next 30 seconds are going to be taken out of context and posted on Twitter, and I'll get canceled for the 17th time. But in his own mind... Hitler was not a villain. He was trying to raise the German people to the heights that they deserved. He was trying to get rid of the internal threats. Um, and so uh, when you have villains, think about how in their own mind they're the hero of the story. Because everyone is the hero of the story. No one in their own mind is the villain of the story. Um, hey, we can that. What's that? We can yeah, that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I paid off my farm, so I don't have a mortgage, so I can survive it when this goes viral. Um, pacing. Uh, there's the Elmore Leonard rule, and speaking of reading out of genre, Elmore Leonard, who writes uh, crime fiction, and he uh, wrote a story that inspired the TV series Justified. He's a, a great writer. Uh, he brings something to the table that most science fiction doesn't, uh, with sort of pacing and dialogue, so go read some Elmore Leonard. And he's got a list of writing secrets, and one of them is Leave out the parts of the story that people are going to skip. I mean, that's so obvious, but you know, it should need to be said, and yet there it is. Uh, so leave out the parts that people are going to skip, but still earn the payoff. Uh, John Barnes is a science fiction writer and one of my favorites, uh, and I was lucky enough that eight or ten years ago, he was briefly in his career between X and Y, and he was offering a service where he would uh, read novels and offer criticism for a couple hundred dollars. Um, and I took him up on it, and it was uh, a huge bargain. Uh, unfortunately, he's not doing it anymore, uh, even though I keep yelling at him uh, the email that he should, because a lot of people would pay it, and it would be a win-win. Uh, but when reading uh, one of the scenes of my novel, uh, he gave specific advice to me, which is the length of the scene has to scale to the intended emotional impact. If the end of the story is, you know, he shoots her. This is the woman who's been making his life miserable, and he shoots her. That's terrible. It's, you know, three words. He shot her. And you wanted more. Like, that's it? So what he said to me is if the the buildup has been so long, you have to make the payoff long. And it might be hard to explain he shot her in 300 words or 3,000 words. But you need to. Because that might actually change the plot. Maybe he didn't shoot her. Maybe he beat her to death with a shovel. Um, and, you know, that could take five or six swings. And that could be sickening. And if we think there's a scene in Fight Club... Um, where the sound cuts out, uh, except for the punching, um, and uh, uh, Jared Leto's character just gets punched over and over and over. Uh, that is a sickening scene, and it has an emotional impact because it stays on the screen for 20 or 30 seconds. And think about those 20 or 30 seconds as opposed to, you know, 14 frames, half a second of a trigger being pulled. Um, let's see. We're in the end, which is good. We're ending uh, time. Dialogue. Uh, sound like real people, uh, but don't sound as jointed as disjointed as real people. Um, there's two mistakes people make at the opposite end of the uh, continuum. One mistake is having speeches and perfectly composed, and the other one is recording some actual you know, dialogue of people and saying, oh, I should write like that. Hey, how's it going? Oh, yeah, um, are you? Yeah, let's do lunch. If you actually listen to how we speak to each other, it's incoherent. 
Um, uh, maybe we, uh, again, as uh, a Spurg, speak a little more coherently, but most people don't. Um, yes. Elmore Leonard is like a sweet spot, again, um, which is very cool to to him, where topics uh, switch and change in their interruptions, but still you're headed in a direction, and if you're not actually revealing plot, you're revealing character. Uh, so there are books on just speech and characterization, and these are worth reading. Uh, show personality in your speech. Uh, you know, each of us speaks differently with different voices. And so if you have someone who keeps heading off in a direction, oh, oh, oh I'm getting off topic, and they come back, that, that's a personality, and that personality is captured in their speech. Someone else might be single-minded and monomaniacal. He starts a conversation. He says, I was thinking about it. We need to do, you know, blah, blah, blah. The other person says, that's great. It's good to see you too, Bob. And then he, the first person backs up and apologizes. And this would be a way of conveying his mono, monomania, his lack of social skills. Um, and it's a lot better to reveal characterization than to state it. If you write, Bob was monomaniacal, that's really boring, awkward, juvenile writing. Speaking of Bob, um, you probably have heard the phrase, as you know Bob. And this refers to a thing that was fairly common in 1950s science fiction, uh, where uh, an engineer would write a novel. And he'd want the backstory, so it would start out with, you know, two scientists are sitting on the space station, and the first would say, as you know, Bob, this is the 17th year that we've occupied the space station. Um, and this is done for a reason, which is the reader needs to be brought up to speed. It's something important about the 18th year of the system we're wearing out. Um, but as you know, Bob, is always a terrible way to do it, so um, try to avoid that. Uh, so do uh, stuff in passing. Um, so the example I have written here is, as you know, Bob, you and I served together in the war. Bad. Um, but another one is the first character says, you know, something about, you know, such and such. And the other one says, oh, you've been complaining about that since boot camp. Implying that, you know, they were together, they know each other, etc. Uh, now moving a bit into the mechanics of writing, point of view. Uh, we all know about first person, you know, uh, I am in the spaceship. Second person is you are in the spaceship. Uh, those are used in writing sometimes in novels. They're both weird. Uh, they're a little experimental. Um, I would suggest that you just don't do that. Uh, you know, at some point, uh, you'll be experienced and you'll say, you know, I know what I'm doing. I can break the rules. Great. When you know what you're doing, go ahead and break the rules. I don't know what I'm doing well enough to break that rule, and I don't want to. 99% of every fiction we've ever read has been in the third person. He did this. She did this. Bob did this. Uh, third person has some subset. Uh, you know, when we speak in language, there's just third person. But in writing, there's third person limited or objective. And this is effectively in a movie if the camera is up high and we just see characters moving back and forth. So every movie you've ever seen probably is third person limited. Um, third person subjective allows interior details of one character's narrative. So you can say, you know, Bob was afraid. Bob, you know, looked at the gra uh, thing. Bob was sweating under his arm is something no one else in the scene would know, and something that the camera, you know, the metaphorical camera mounted up on the roof would know. <clears throat> um, and then there's third-person omniscient, where we know that both Bob is sweating, and Doug is nervous, and, you know, Stan is enraged. Um, I think that the best and conventional thing is third-person subjective or third-person close, where one motivation is known. And the way I like to explain this is that basically the, the narrative camera is hovering over one person's shoulder. Uh, it's over their shoulders, so you can talk about their body, you can talk about how they feel, you can talk about their thoughts. Now, if you've got a complex novel, you'll want to get inside uh, multiple characters. And so I suggest that you do that at chapter uh, at, uh, at, at chapter break. So you can be inside one character, and the next character, you can hop sideways to the other person who is interacting. Uh, Larry McMurtry, um, who wrote Westerns, and again, reading out of the genre, uh, Lonesome Dove is a great novel, a big sprawling novel. Larry McMurtry knew what he was doing, and he can break the rules, and he does so, and it is for an artistic effect, where there's sort of a sprawling, ethereal sense of it, and, you know, almost like the, the landscape is controlling things, and the camera pans from one head into another head into the landscape as a whole. Uh, so if you know what you're doing, feel free to ignore me. <laughs> um, another point, information density on the page without looking like it's dense. Um, a single sentence or a single scene can do multiple, and should do multiple things. Everyone's familiar with Firefly, and there's one scene uh, in one of the first couple of episodes, the flashback, the Battle of Serenity Valley, 
and Malcolm Reynolds picks up a cross, kisses it, um, and then we don't see that cross till later. And this, you know, in, in half a second on screen explains this character arc of he lost his faith because his political group lost the war. Um, and aim for information then. Uh, what is the opposite of excellence? This whole speech has been excellence in writing. Um, the opposite of excellence is the first draft. Uh, it's doing things for reasons other than achieving excellence. Uh, it is possible that if you aim for excellence, you will also make some money. I, I've been lucky enough to make some money in writing, as I didn't expect. Um, but you can't aim for, you know, if you aim for making money, you won't. But if you aim for excellence, you might. Um, it's overly formulaic. Now, uh, Hans and I fight about something. Uh, Frank Gruber's 11-point formula. Uh, Frank Gruber wrote for the uh, Pulps uh, back on what decade? 30s, 40s? Uh, I'm actually working with, I use a different formula. You do? Okay. Yeah. There are formulas. I looked up one of these, and there is a formula, and it worked for one or two writers, or probably for many writers, in an era when they were writing five- and eight-page stories for weekly magazines, and the goal was, hey, I'm getting paid one cent a word, let me entertain the teens and let me crank out things. So one of these uh, rules was every story you write should have a different uh, profession for the protagonist. It should have a different murder weapon. It should have a different location of the murder. Yeah. Yes, okay. There are multiple formulas, uh, and I think they overlap. Um, I think that these are great formulas for writing pulp fiction in the 30s and 40s. I think that they uh, provide something to get your information or your imagination flowing. Um, but I think, you know, just as a, uh, a claw tooth hammer is a great uh, tool for doing framing or even demolition, it's not good for building a cathedral. Um, and so my thought is more about building big structures. Uh, so this is a useful tool, but it's not the only useful tool. Um, I talked before about self-similarity, where themes, you know, as above, so below, uh, where, you know, Ripley in Aliens is mothering, and we see that both, uh, you know, cut scenes uh, where she was in uh, deep sleep and missed the growth of a child, and then it reflects in Newt, and it reflects in a battle. There is a uh, novel that I read by someone in our greater tribe, and uh, it starts out on page one with a battle between a Catholic space knight, power armor, and a demon. Now, this is reasonable. It's not my first choice of genre, but you can do a good job here. So, this Catholic space knight He's a Catholic space knight. He's got Deus Bolt written on his sword or something. This implies a lot of things. We want self-similarity. Um, he's fighting a demon. So we've got laid out right here on the page the battle between good and evil, maybe in a certain medieval mindset, certainly in a uh, Christian Catholic mindset. How does he kill the demon, right? If I were to write the scene, first his sword breaks. Then his uh, revolver is kicked away. Um, and then finally, at the moment when the demon is coming in, he grabs his rosary and says a prayer. And that's what defeats the demon. And this is unifying. It brings everything all together. Uh, I was reading this, and I was on page three. And he defeats the demon by pulling out his maroon-colored uh, colored revolver. And he shoots the demon. And this is from a video game. You know, because the revolver had plus 11 damage points, and the demon only had six damage points left or something. Uh, there was an absolute lack of self-similarity an absolute lack of team. Um, I wouldn't do that. Um, all right, excellent. Uh, I was worried that there were 10 more pages, but they're not worth the very last uh, page. Conclusion. Go for it. Uh, aim for excellence and achieve excellence. Aim for re uh, Read and reread great books and stories and analyze them. This is like a homework assignment. Um, there's a, a short story, Johnny Mnemonic. Reread it. Very short. You know, figure out what is excellent. What is Act 2? What is Act 3? Um, Reread Starship Troopers. Why do each of the characters exist? And it's not just to move the plot forward, it's to expose aspects of the theme and to interact with each other. Look at Dune. Uh, Reread Dune and look at the thematic unity through all of it. Uh, read Hamlet and look at the tropes. Uh, write a million words. The first million will be bad, but at the end of the million, I would be amazed if you did not write something that's pretty darn good. Revise, revise, revise. Best time to start writing a great novel was 10 years ago. The second best time is tomorrow morning. <laughs> Just do it. Um, and then finally, uh, don't get distracted by talking. Do it. There is a huge... Uh, we talked earlier about calories, and that so many things are uh, motivated by information, by dollars, uh, by energy flows. 
there is a huge uh, a set of discussion forums out there on the internet. There are magazines, writers' journals, there are writers' conferences. These exist because of calorie flows. People see uh, people with energy, people with dollars, they advertise to them, they market to them. These are ways to waste your time. Um, and so I've got a set of references. Um, I, I've read, you know, 50 uh, books on how to write. I've winnowed it down to 20 or so. I'm not going to read them out loud, um, but I will work with Rob uh, maybe to put something up on the website. I'll probably host it at morelockpublishing.com, my website, and we'll link this from BaseCon. Um, and that's it. And uh, I don't know if we've got any time for questions. Rob, do we? No, we got Okay, great. Hans. I'll ask a question. <laughs> you talked about the importance of a three-act structure, mm-hmm. something similar to it to motivate the overall organization yeah. of a book, and about the importance of self-similarity. Yeah. How does that play out in the context of an individual chapter within a book, and dare I say a formula for right. doing those chapters, <laughs> and how does it, on a smaller scale, right. and how does it play out on the larger scale between how you organize the contents of an individual book <clears throat> in a series? I love this question. This is a great question. Um, so, yes, uh, I, I have talked about self-similarity many times. One of my favorite um, artistic formats was effectively invented in the 1990s or so, and that was the seven-season TV show with season-long plot. And so we get self-similarity, fractal nature, where each episode starts, has a problem, gets resolved. Over the course of a season, there is a larger uh, three-act structure where we get a new problem, a new villain of the season, a new hero of the season, and it gets resolved. And then ideally, over the seven-season run, all the same thing happens. Um, the Sopranos, I think, was one of the first shows to do the season-long arc. I don't think it nailed the seven-season uh, or six-season arc. It did a little bit with Tony himself, um, but other shows have done a better job. So I would say, um, if you read books on how to write for TV and screen, they do a great job of a lot of stuff. And even though I'm saying TV is sort of downstream of literature. They've done a much better job of analyzing things, so there's a lot of great books out there. Um, speaking to Hans' specific thing, I would argue that an ideal Act 1 is self-similar in that it has a sub-Act 1, 2, and 3. Um, especially in the case of a huge, sprawling work like my Aristotle's books, which was 1,300 pages. If we just ran at a normal flow, by the time you even knew who the characters were and how they reacted, you'd be 400 pages in. No one is going to sit still for 400 pages and sort of gradually spoon fed you. Harry Sherwood does still sell books. I've read some Harry Turtle stuff, but um, I, I think that uh, he does a great job of kickstarting the action. And you always know exactly what you're going to get inside of five or eight pages. Uh, so, uh, but so Act One, I think needs a sub Act One, Two, and Three. And so I, I hate to keep referring to my own books, um, but in Aristillus, Mike has a uh, Mike Martin has a subplot in the first fifty or hundred pages, <laughs> where there is well, not quite a zoning dispute, um, but a, a land use dispute or a registry dispute, and he has an antagonist. He has you know a resolution, um, and they're they're peaking uh, structure, and it is a different antagonist than the antagonist over the course of the entire book. Um, so I, I think that having a, a sub react structure in Act 1 is a, certainly a technique that's worked for me. There might be other techniques. Well, you spoke a lot about the importance of uh, reading other fiction both in genre and out of genre. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the influence of reading nonfiction on uh, the right. Great. Um, so yeah. for those who didn't hear from the microphone, uh, Lowell said you spoke about uh, reading genre fiction. You spoke about reading outside of genre fiction. Can you talk about reading nonfiction? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, you know, I read uh, physics, economics, uh, space technology, and other stuff. Um, and I read a, a ton of, um, I don't know, real world craft uh, stuff. You know, I, I probably got more welding books on my shelf than you know most people have books in their houses. Um, especially for hard science fiction, which is another panel. I, I think it's super important to uh, read, you know, how-to books or factual books or historical books. Um, you know, Tolkien, obviously, uh, as a linguistics professor, read a ton of linguistics textbooks over his time. Um, 
I think that the more widely you read, the more interesting and the more uh, complex your worldview will be. Uh, I've got a very minor detail in the Aristillus novel where some naive characters talk about moving to the moon and bringing economics 2.0 with them because they will show the capitalism that this is all very silly. And uh, this is actually me uh, poking Charlie Strauss, um, who I think has not read remotely enough economics and doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, you know, I would say that economics is not a hard science, but it is, uh, it is striving to be a science. Um, if you are going to write fantasy, I think you need to read history, uh, probably linguistics. If you're going to write, you know, hard science fiction, you need to read a lot of physics. Um, I, I write semi-hard science fiction, and I read, you know, physics and economics and space exploration, and I've got, you know, files and files of notes, and I've got spreadsheets talking about, you know, where the troposphere is, and, you know, plasma heating and re-entry, um, so that's how I like to do things, uh, so I, I guess yes uh, is an answer to the question, <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I encourage reading widely. Yes, in the front row, Jason. Lord of the Rings, we had the uh, eagles that come to the yeah. point, and they you know, defeat the enemy, and they pick up the hobbits, and yeah. bring it close to the mortal, and all that. And, and, and the air still, so you have the AI, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, this AI has done all this background work in the background. Yep. We didn't find out until yep. it starts defeating the, the widows down. Yeah. The the it seems like a pretty dangerous uh, thing to write in, you know, and, and work out. <laughs> Here in Lord of the Rings, you know, why not put the panel to call it earlier? Right. Yeah. Right. How do you get past that task? Did you have to, like, revise it six times? Um, so, A, I did revise it six times. When you say a dangerous thing, can you say sort of AI is dangerous, or are you saying as a plot element? As a plot element, right. it's like that just goes over the whole. Right. Um, so, uh, there are two more novels uh, coming that talk about uh, AI. Um, there were a lot of Chekhov guns about this, and you might have to reread the eye, and, and they were very deeply hidden. Um, so, I, I, so first of all, Gamma saving the day uh, was sort of a deep joke to myself that this was a little bit of a because there was the, the god of the machine that swooped in and acted free to save the day. Um, however, as far as, you know, did, did I just drop that in there without, you know, thought? Uh, there are details earlier where people are noticing, this is interesting, there is an anonymous uh, decentralized market in purchasing tunnels, and we don't know who is purchasing them, and the price is rising. I guess it's just speculation. I don't know why people are buying these tunnels. It is later revealed that Gamma, Gamma itself, has been buying these tunnels to put build AI drives. There is another detail that a small ship that Gamma built that intercepted Darcy's uh, ship had a kind of battery that was cheaper to build, um, but did not have dust shielding, as it was designed to be only used in a clean room environment. Uh, there was another detail that the sort of waste heat level seemed to be higher. Um, there was another detail of where did all of the nuclear fuel go? Someone bought it up. Um, and so if you piece all of these together, and had actually been planning this for a year ahead of time, and had been doing lots of stuff behind the scenes to plan this eventual escape. Um, so as far as, what are you afraid that a runaway, all-powerful AI is a godlike figure that can do anything both in the human universe and also through the plot of your book? Um, absolutely, I was aware of that. Like I said, Aristotle's 3 and 4 talk about unconstrained AI. One of the themes um, of Aristotle's 3 and 4 is systems, uh, you know, things that are constrained and escaping using the limited tool set inside the prison to get out. Uh, so I've got a lot more to say on the topic. And Rob is up here, so I think he's going to hurry me along. How many more questions, Rob? Well, I'm looking for my hand. Okay. Um, I'll see one more quick question. Okay. I, I saw a hand up. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm happy to answer more questions afterwards. Over here. What have you learned about your own writing process after writing your first novel? How did it change into your second? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so on the first one, my individual motivations, and if we talk about habits, right, um, if your goal is to get in shape and start running, you might say, I need a soft on-ramp to this. So I'm not going to say I have to go 10 miles. I'm not going to say that I'm not allowed to walk. I'm going to say my victory condition is getting up every day and putting my sneakers on and at least going to my mailbox. Um, and so I was very much in that situation 10 years ago when I started writing. I had tried to start a novel several times and I failed every time. So I said my victory condition is to just effing write every day. 
So I had a different set of constraints there. I was optimizing for just doing something. Um, and so I did just something. I, I forced myself to write, I think, at first 250 words a day, which is one page. I eventually upped that to a thousand words, uh, then to an hour, then to two hours. Um, but because of that, plotting is hard. Uh, making sure that your plot makes sense is hard. So I didn't put those constraints on myself. I said, just write. Uh, so my process in the first draft of Aristillus was different than my process right now. My process there was write something and end it with a cliffhanger. And the cliffhanger was both for the audience and it was for me. Uh, with a cliffhanger, I would have something interesting to pick up the next day. Uh, there's also another trick that I've learned out there, which is always leave a scene in the middle of a, uh, always leave writing for the day in the middle of the scene and in the middle of a sentence. Huh. It gives you a very easy on ramp the next morning when you get back. My process these days is different. It is much more outline heavy because I had to do so much work in the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth drafts of Aristillus to fix the horror show I had made in draft one that I don't want to repeat that. I believe that I've now got a problem, which is the second system syndrome, which is I think I'm doing too much plotting and too little cliffhangers, so I'm trying to uh, fix that and do somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and just as some background to that, uh, right now I'm about a month back into working on Aristotle's 3 and 4 and cleaning up the outlines, uh, and I hope to get it done. A perfect off-ramp to the conversation. Hope to be done in two or three years and have new books. And uh, I very much appreciate the more questions. I'd be happy to meet with people uh, uh, afterwards and talk some more. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for. Uh Talked many times about multiple revisions. A lot of people have said, hey, Travis. Why don't you do a subscription service or a Patreon and you can deliver, you know, so many uh, pages a month? And the answer is, you know, Aristillus had a lot of self-similarity. It had a ton of checkup done. And, like, none of those were there in the first draft. And just like what Rob was saying, get to the end of the book and you're like, oh, God, this character could have gotten the motivation from that, from that character. And then you go back and on the second draft uh, and start to tie it together. And so if you publish, and as Dickens did, if you publish, you know, bit by bit by bit, you can never go back and tie stuff together, uh, whereas delaying it allows you to really leave. Okay.